And I did that 365 days a year. It was the hardest time of my life, but every penny counted then. You are listening to the Property Developer Podcast, your home for tips, ideas, and inspiration to help take your developing to the next level. Now here's your host, Justin Getty. Hello, and welcome to episode 77 of the show. Thanks for joining me. How are you doing? How are your projects going? I'm doing well. Enjoying a bit of a summer break at the moment, spending time with family and friends, and reflecting on what a strange year 2020 turned out to be. I hope you managed to make the most out of 2020, and I hope that 2021 proves to be another successful year for you. My projects have turned out reasonably well in the end. We've finished laying all the foundations on Project 1, with framing well underway now. We've sold 50% of the stock and got out of the ground without any major issues. So given the year we had, that's a pretty good outcome. On Project 2, I'm continuing discussions with a number of builders about their tender response and working through the various questions, issues and opportunities that have come up. We'll be looking to start construction on that one in the middle of 2021. We're being held up a little bit by the fact that we can't evict our current tenants due to a freeze on giving notice in Victoria due to government interventions brought on by COVID. And that's going to be another great townhouse project to bring to market and I'm excited about getting everything construction ready. Now, if you would like to see how my projects are progressing, I do post regular video updates on the show's Facebook, Instagram and LinkedIn feeds, along with other news and tidbits. And they are all under the handle of Property Developer Podcast. So be sure to check them out. I'm also excited about launching my new online training program in the coming months, which is currently under development. Pardon the pun. One of the first pieces that I've completed is a short assessment tool that people can use to see how ready they might be to get started in developing, if that's what they're interested in. If you would like to check it out, head to www.propertydevelopertraining.com and take a look. This is in addition to the mentoring program that is available, so if you want to make 2021 the year when you take the step into property development, then email me, justin at propertydeveloperpodcast.com, and I can send you some further info. Just before we get to today's guest, the next episode of the show will feature my follow-up conversation with Rod Fairing from Fraser's Property. If you didn't catch the first chat in episode 76, be sure to go back and have a listen as it was full of great anecdotes and terrific lessons from someone who has a long and storied career in property development. In our second chat, we go deeper into the key projects that Rod worked on and discuss why they were successful, along with many other nuggets of wisdom that he has discovered along the way. He's very generous with what he shares with us. Okay, on with the show. My guest today is somebody who I regularly get emails from listeners wanting to hear from him. So I'm excited about finally being able to bring him to you. So, Jonathan Hallinan from BPM Corp has followed the quintessential property development path. Starting off with a small property purchase, doing a renovation and subdivision, then getting into small multi-unit townhouse developments, graduating into apartment projects, and finally leaping into high-rise buildings with hundreds of units in them. Jonathan worked tirelessly on his projects, often directly managing all aspects of the process, including doing sales himself. He learnt a lot along the way and he shares many lessons during this discussion. Keep an ear out for how Jonathan managed the rise from small to big projects. The one key aspect of managing the whole process that enabled him to accelerate his growth and how he stayed focused throughout his career. I'm sure you will enjoy this conversation, so let's start out by discovering what food Jonathan would eat until he was sick. Oh, (laughs) jeez. Oh, God, that's an interesting question. Probably ice cream. Particular flavour? Like fish food. It's a Ben and Jerry's flavour. What? Love it. Yeah, it's called fish food. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, it's unbeatable. Uh, you're a guy who likes branding. What's your thoughts on calling an ice cream flavour fish food? Oh, look, it grab my attention. <laughs> if it grabs your attention, then yeah, it's good. So the next question I have to ask is, does it taste like fish food? No, no, not at all. No, so, no but it's bloody good. Yeah, what, what is it? I've got to ask what it tastes like. What's, what's look, it's just chocolate and marshmallow in there and then it's got these dark chocolate little fishes in there. 
Right. Pretty right. incredible. Give it a go. <laughs> well, I will. I'm certainly not going to forget the name of the flavour. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, that's one of the more interesting answers we've got so far on the show. So, uh, yeah, good to know, ice cream. Thanks for joining us. It's uh, good to finally get you on the show. I've been trying to reach you for a little while now. You're one of the people that I often get requests for me to try and um, have you on as a guest. So thank you for coming on. No problem. Obviously, we're here to talk about property development. So let's have a bit of a trip down memory lane. Can you give us a bit of an mm. idea of where you got started and we'll eventually sure. get to where you are today, but you've ended up doing some large tower projects, but I, my understanding is you didn't start off that way. Yeah, no, look, I started as a, an apprentice carpenter. It's really sort of what got me into the, uh, I would say, you know, the property world. My goal was always to be a property developer. And I had some advice pretty early on that, you know, to get started as a property developer, you needed a lot of equity and the best way to sort of get that equity and get into that sort of property world was going to be through construction. So I went straight out of school into uh, studying at RMIT at night, construction management, and doing an apprenticeship during the day. Um, through doing the apprenticeship, you know, I got a good insight. I mostly worked for a builder that did subdivisions. So that gave me a good insight into the process of property development and some of the risks and things to look out for. And then obviously studying construction management gave me, you know, more of the, the academic side of it, which, you know, was invaluable as well. Um, I bought my first property when I was 19 and I've been, I saved for that property from when I was 10. Did a sold papers on the street out the front of AFL Park and saved up, uh, I think it was about 12 grand. I bought my first property for 90. I subdivided that property, I renovated the front one and uh, built a unit on the back. And, you know, I was very lucky in timing as well. I mean, you probably say I was born in the, the perfect year to be a property developer in Australia. Came, came out of school in the early 90s, just out of coming out of the property slump of 91 and then into, you know, what's been a 25-year boom from sort of 93, 95 onwards, which has then allowed me to, you know, grow that business and even make, you know, let me make some mistakes because the market would fix my mistakes. And also, you know, back then, you didn't need the levels of equity that you needed now. The percentages that we did and the way we would borrow money and the relationships we'd have with banks allowed us to do things you could never do again today. So it was an easier process then. I'm just going to jump in there because you mentioned that you always wanted to be a property developer and you started saving at 10, which is pretty remarkable. But mm. What drove you or what, what was the thinking, the reasoning behind wanting to be a property developer when you were so young? Look, I just think I always had an interest in wealthy, successful people. You know, I wasn't ever sort of the kid that was really into toys or, um, you know, I admired wealthy people and spent my weekends reading about them. I followed, you know, the Grollo family very closely. I followed Ron Walker, Lloyd Williams, who developed Crown Casino. They were the original developers. Um, you know, what they did and what they created, how they went about it. They were sort of my idols right from when I was 10. And I was just on a track from then. I was going to make it happen and I was determined to be incredibly successful. I also grew up in a very academic family that really valued academic success as success. And, you know, that wasn't where I, I knew I was going to get my success from or that wasn't where I was going to be, you know, amazing at. So I was out to prove them wrong as well. So I had a bit of a chip on my shoulder to say, you know, I'll show you. I can. I may not have this, this academic success that a lot of my family had and broader family had, but, you know, I'm going to have a success maybe, you know, none of you have even dreamed of. And so you did the theoretical university side, but also the practical uh, um, apprentice side as well to balance that That's out? That's correct. Yes, I did. Yeah, which allowed me to fast track it. After two and a half years of a four and a half year apprenticeship, I was able to apply for an early release because I owned my first house and developing it, building a house on the back. I was halfway through the degree. I put it all together and packaged it up and they gave me an early release from my carpentry apprenticeship, which then got me my builder's license really quickly. And it was just everything for me was how can I fast track this system to start, you know, on my road to real success. So that first project, which was your first investment, that you'd count that as your first project? Yeah, I would, yeah. Okay, yeah. so then you got your builder's license. Then what happened? Well, 
you know, it was a very successful project. I, you know, I bought the front house for 90 grand. I spent, you know, just my carpentry apprenticeship money and a little bit of weekend project money uh, renovating it. I remember I sold that front house and made $100,000. And I remember I bought the whole property for only 90. So to make $100,000, I'm now only 20. It was like I thought I was the king. You know, it was just incredible. Then I spent that 100000 building the unit on the back. I lived in the front one, so it was obviously my principal place. It was tax-free. I then moved into the back one, principal place, tax-free, made another $100,000 on that. And then I had 200000 And then I went and bought a number of two, three, four unit sites. Started my building company, started the businesses, the process, sorry, the business processes, really started creating the brand BPM from then. I realized that everyone was buying my product before it was finished. So I needed something that people could rely on, know that we would deliver. And it all just flowed on from there. Just take us back to those, some of those earlier small subdivision sites. What were you, you must have been on the tools back then, but. <laughs> Um, what were you doing? You were doing everything or were you project managing more so? I was like a development manager, project manager, site supervisor and carpenter. So I did, would do all the carpentry but I, and also labourer. You know, really, if I could do it, I was there. You know, I was on site at six and I was working. You know, when I was doing my apprenticeship, you know, I was doing from 7 to 3.30 in the apprenticeship and I'd do my... Three nights a week, I was doing going to university in the city, and the other nights I was working till midnight, one o'clock on my house renovating it. And I did that 365 days a year. It was the hardest time of my life, but every penny counted then. It really did. And because I was in such a rush, I always pushed my money to its limits. You know, I was doing it on my own. I didn't have any backing, didn't have any family financial support, anything like that. Um, so every day mattered. It's one thing I think I learned on those early times was because I had so much control over the entire process, because I was doing it, I could make the process so much quicker than my competitors, which then allowed me to sell my products slightly cheaper than them and then move on and keep turning them over. How long since you strapped on a tool belt? Oh, it's been a long time. Yeah. So you've got one somewhere? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I do. <laughs> yeah, I, I wasn't a good carpenter. It wasn't what I was great at, and it wasn't where I was, my mindset was at. It was like I was doing it to, for a purpose to get you know, to get to the next stage. It wasn't my love or my passion. But you know, I still am fastidious about little things that I learned as a carpenter. You know, like architraves and gaps between doors and walls. I'm still you know implement a lot of what I learned there in my even my large scale projects today. And so velocity of finishing projects, you've just mentioned as one important lesson. Were there anything, were there any others from those early days that you've carried through? It's really control and knowing everything. I think a lot of people I find in, you know, can be a property developer. They think, you know, we find a real estate agent, buy a property, take it to the architect. The architect designs and tells you what to do. And then the real estate agent sells it and get a builder. You know, I, it wasn't like that for me. It was it was my design, my control, my build, my sales. I just had control of everything and did everything on my own. I didn't use real estate agents. I didn't use architects. I didn't use anyone's ideas on anything. It was all from my own research and it was my own ideas. So how it wasn't you at all taking advice. How are you selling? I just put a way? sign out the front. I'd advertise in the local newspapers and, you know, I did billboards in the local areas and just took the phone calls myself. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. Did, uh, did you find any hesitation when you were dealing with prospective purchases or did they feel more comfortable dealing direct? Yeah, look, I think it was one of the secrets to my success. I only stopped selling myself about 10 years ago. So every single property I did right up until 10 years ago and then I got a sales and marketing manager on. But pre that, you know, I did $250 million worth of projects in Brighton. I sold every single one of them. But it allowed me to build a relationship with the buyer and often my buyer was a downsizer. It might be an elderly couple or even an elderly lady on her own that's lost her husband. You know, I took them on the journey and really looked after them. And even after they moved in, you know, I built this whole process that, you know, they felt very secure and safe and they had someone to call and it was me that sold it to them. It was me that handed over it to them. It was me that made sure my guys were there in the move-in. So it was very personalised service. And as you got bigger, and we, we will get back to your <laughs> progression, but is that something mm. that you had to learn to let go of as you're obviously having way too much stock mm. or numbers of stock that yeah. you just couldn't physically sure. sell yourself any longer? Is that a challenge? Yeah. 
probably one of the greatest challenges was, yeah, when I really started to grow, when I decided to stop doing my building my business organically, meaning all on my own with my own equity, just progressing it completely within my own means. I took on investment and especially joint venture partners within projects. I then had to build a big team around me. And yeah, it was incredibly challenging because I attributed my success to the control. Letting go of some of the control was something that was a very, very difficult process for me. And I had to really become a leader rather than a, a doer. I didn't, you know, for the last 10 years, I don't actually do a lot. I just control it all and manage it all and lead it all. And is that, are you still finding that a challenge or do you, have you managed to transcend no, that now? Yeah, yeah, no, I've let that go now. But, you know, I've had a lot of help. I had a business coach for a lot of years that came in and, you know, taught me how to do it, built the business with, you know, built the process and built the management team and built the process that allowed me to do it. Yeah, I didn't do it on my own. Was that a conscious decision to get a coach? Was it something that you felt you needed or just sort of... Um, I think it was getting so big and I was working seven days a week and I uh, got to a point where I was super stressed every day. Coming from getting more and more stressed, more and more anxious with it. And I thought, you know, I can't live life like this. So someone recommended this, you know, a business coach that came in and, you know, totally revolutionised how I... I ran my business and that was lucky because it allowed me to then grow tenfold. What were some of the key pieces you would say that were put in place from that mentoring or coaching? Definitely, the, definitely it was the, the employment of people. You know, I think we had about eight and I went to 30 very, very quickly. And it was the investment in, in creating that, that the office, the culture, the people, that process around that, me letting go. Um, you know, it was... I mean, I think he was as much a therapist as a business coach. You know, he, he really guided me through. I go, you know, I attribute a lot of my success to him, actually. Oh, well, that's good. And he's still, t- it's going to sound like a funny question. He's still together today? <laughs> no, 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 no. Look, he was, a, I think, he, look, he was in, we were involved in the business for about five years. Yeah. And then, you know, I felt like I didn't need him anymore. <laughs> Let's go uh, back to your, to your history. Um, Talk us through what happened sort of after these sub smaller subdivision projects, your, your two, your three, your four unit subdivision. What was the evolution from there? Well, really it was then getting into apartments. I was Most of these were units and townhouse developments. And then it was getting into apartments. And I started in areas which is, you know, a little bit out of uh, Bayside area of Bentley. I moved into the Brighton area because what I thought was I'm going to create a brand that's so well known in one suburb Brighton's a very clicky area. A lot of people know each other. A lot of people have lived there over generations. So once I started to build a brand there, especially a brand that where we delivered and we're building these beautiful buildings that people loved, um, it became, you know, I basically had the whole market. It was, if you were downsizing or wanting to buy an apartment, you came to us. You know, we would have developers launching their projects at the same time as us. They wouldn't sell one. We would sell every single one of them. Because um, I just owned the market, and I attribute that solely to the brand. And because you know, like every decision I made every day wasn't about the profit at that time; it was just purely about building the brand and delivering a product that you know exceeded people's expectations. So that you know they went through the journey of buying off the plan. By the time they moved in, you know they were really, really happy, and also that we were delivering value. I think that's you know something very important that I've you know I've always desire to do with people that buy off the plan actually financially do well out of it as well. So you've mentioned brand. So can you explain to us what brand means to you when you say, I was building a brand? What does that mean to you? Well, for me, I mean, every brand is different. Mine, I was building a luxury brand, but we delivered an affordable product. I was never building the super high-end luxury product although I was using super high-end architects, interior designers, build quality standards, the product was at an affordable price. So it was building a brand that was recognisable, number one, and then it stood for luxury and quality, but at an affordable price. Um, it was also building it something that would, people would intrigue people. I remember, I remember looking through the local papers, and you know, 20 years ago, people were still reading the papers. They'd buy the Saturday age and read the domain that was the big property forum back then 
And I remember opening the Saturday age, looking at the domain, everything was bright reds and blues and white. Everything was brighter and brighter. And, brighter. and I thought, you know what I'm going to do is I'm going to darken the whole thing off. So I'd buy full page ads every weekend and it would be almost black. I'd darken all my imagery up so that when you're flicking through it, the minute you'd see it, you would know it was us. And at the very least, it would be like, oh my God, what is that? And people would become intrigued in it. Yeah, well, we might get to some uh, chat around colours when we get to your shadow play video, but that I think yes. uh, that's for later on. Sure. I want to ask you about the transition that you made from townhouses to apartments and how much of a leap that was for you. Uh, look, it is a very different business, very different business building three units on a corner of a site in Bentley to starting to build multi-unit developments. You know, you have to become a much more sophisticated business. Um, the way that you borrow the money and the people that you're borrowing the money from, even from within banks, within the banking system, becomes much more sophisticated. And obviously the bigger the project, it's certainly, you know, a different, completely different world. You know, the criteria that you have to meet is is worlds apart. You know, I could go and do a three unit site and basically do a handshake with the bank manager and off we go. Provide a small amounts of Excel spreadsheets and documentation and things like this, estimates of sales price, it would be very, very easy. You start getting into larger scale apartment buildings, you know, there's a lot of criteria that needs to be met and you need to be you know, really seen as a sophisticated business that can deliver, make sure it can deliver. Delivery is everything. And so what was your thinking about going from the townhouse to the apartment? Was that just, you saw that as a natural evolution or you wanted to move into a more denser product? Look, right from the very beginning, I wanted to build high-rise buildings in the city. That was the goal. And it was whatever was going to take me to get to me to that, get me to that place. That was going to be a big, big leap, you know, to try and, you know, come from absolutely zero, nothing, to building $300 million towers in the city was going to take, was going to, you know, be a difficult process. So I needed to progress, I needed to get into larger scale projects and make sure that you know I had the brand and the systems to deliver them oh, every God. single time. I knew I couldn't make a mistake. Well, you've just spoiled the ending of the podcast when we get to your $300 million building, but <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> no Hopefully people will keep listening. Uh, yeah. So multiple apartment projects around the Bayside area, is that what happened next? That's, yeah, that's right. Look, I'm, yeah, really uh, honed in on that, the, the suburb of Brighton. I always did the outer suburbs as well. So we had, the Brighton stock was more prestige and a higher end price, but, you know, I was always doing all those outer suburbs as well. But to a point I was running sort of anywhere between 15 and 20 projects at one time. And how did you find that at the time? Just absolutely loved it. It's what I'm built to do. This is my passion, it's my motivator, it's my driver, it's just everything. There's nothing. When I buy a site, you get me into that office and I start designing, working it out, running a FISO, doing the numbers, what's, how's it going to make this site profitable, running all the floor plans, that's, I'm just in my absolute element. And you must still drive by a lot of these sites or some of these sites. What, what do you think? Well, I think that's something that's amazing about property development is you know the legacy that we leave behind and you know, how rewarding it is you know property development we buy the site we get excited we design the bills and we get excited we start selling it and it's exciting but yeah to stand back at the end of it and look at it or when i drive around certain suburbs where i've got a lot of developments yeah incredibly rewarding uh, some of your early ones still standing yeah, they are. Still square? My business model is we actually keep, I've kept 20% of everything I've ever developed. So, yeah, I still have rental properties within every single development. Yeah. So, yeah, I still, still, still go back there. All the doors still shut nice and square? Oh, look, I'm not saying we've never had problems, of course. <laughs> the more you do, the more problems you have. <laughs> so, take us then through the, the next step going from apartments to What's the stepping stone to, to something bigger? What, what, what did you do there? Well, really, it was then to say, look, I really want to take... So I was, as I was going through that stage, where I was managing everything. I was in control of everything. And I was probably doing, you know, as I said, 15 to 20 projects at once, but all sort of between maybe 15 and 50 units each. And I realised at this time, if I was going to grow to the next level, I was, wasn't going to be able to do it organically. I was going to need... Not a business partner. I didn't ever want anyone to be a partner in the BPM brand, but partners within developments. 
and I really learned to become, you know, somebody that people could rely on. I would deliver the project. I could give financial outcomes. By this stage, I had very sophisticated financial processes. And uh, so what I did was I did a big PR campaign. I started talking to the media about what I'd done and what I produced. And it's, you know, the age had done it and the story. Then this brought in multiple offers to finance my projects from, from an equity point of view. And then that's when I was able to buy multiple, much larger scale projects. And, you know, I, I got people to, you know, believe in my ability to go from a 50 unit site to a 150 unit site. Then obviously we went all the way to 500 unit site. And talk us through how you did that. What was your underlying reasoning? For them to believe in me? Yeah, that you could make that um, transition. Sure. Well, I think it was that I had delivered. You know, I'd done it on my own. I came from nothing. I hadn't had a failed project. Um, you know, I believe in win-win scenarios of business. I never, ever do a deal that's not win-win. That goes right down from the smallest to the biggest deals. And, you know, I created a structure that I was in it with them. It wasn't like they were putting in all the equity and that they were taking all the risk. You know, we were in it for the gains and we were in it for if there was any losses, which there hasn't been. But, you know, we were in it together, very much together. You know, and I took on, you know, two major investors that really, you know, took my business to, you know, an entire new level. And so what was the first large-ish or tower project that you tackled? Um, probably the more larger. I went from that when I said I was going to the 50 unit sites using just purely my own equity. Then I started doing 150 unit sites. You know, I did you know, a few of those, a couple in Brisbane, a couple in Melbourne, and they were very, very successful because, again, I had full control of them. My building company built them all. You know, my sales guys sold them all. Again, the process just was so fast and so efficient. And I was able to sell just slightly below the market. And my product was excellent that it just, you know, the success was incredible. So fast. And obviously, when you have an investor, they talk about internal rate of return. It's how many days did you have my money and what was the return on it? Not just what was the return on my money, but how many days did it take you to get me that return? And that's what I was able to build. You know, what I say, I own the development cycle. There's no part of the development cycle that I didn't own. We ran every single part of it. We weren't reliant externally. And was there a step up after that? You'd done 150 unit sites? That well, then I did multiple of them. We started running more and more of that scale of project. And then I started getting into looking more into office buildings, hotels, and then getting into you know, the multiple hundred unit sites. And what was that transition? What were the challenges that you found making that even uh, making that step up? Look, the greatest challenge is it's uh, especially because I was considered very young to be doing it. Not a lot of individuals do those those scale projects. They're mostly institutions or um, foreign money where there's huge amounts of equity. The equity, uh, you know, loan to value ratios change a lot when you get into the larger scale projects. They are much higher risk. That and also just to get people believing in me that I could go from 150 to 500. You know, I needed you know a lot of stakeholders. Obviously, my investors, banks, other you know equity lend or you know finance lenders get involved when you start borrowing money you know into the hundreds of millions it's you don't just walk into one bank it's not one bank that lends us the money it's multiple layers many people are involved and it's making sure that each one of those stakeholders absolutely believe in my ability to deliver it and would you say that's probably more of the bigger challenges that you face when comparing to the smaller projects when you look back to those early days it's basically just you pulling the strings yeah um, look, certainly once you're getting into that scale, there's no way you're, you, know, you can be reliant just on myself. I had to rely on the business, the, you know, the company structure and process to, to deliver that for me and really believe in it. It was a huge leap because you, know, you start doing multiple hundreds. As I said, everyone is talking about time on money. You know, property development where people go mostly go wrong is it takes them too long and it's the time on the project that eats, eats away at the margin. Um, and on these large scale projects, you can you know start to burn very, very quickly. Every single day matters.
but you know that's why I had to be. It was my, you know, completely my entire life. There was nothing else more important to me at that time than than delivering those projects. Well, you've managed to retain a fairly good head of hair, so you must have been doing something reasonably good to manage your stress <laughs> levels at the time. Yeah, I don't know how I've still got hair to believe, believe me. There's been some sleepless nights. <laughs> and so it's a stressful you... business. Yeah, it can be, certainly. There's a um, lot of unknowns and there's a lot of facets to it. Yeah, absolutely. And what was the biggest project that you delivered? Well, it was the biggest project I've delivered is Shadow Play. It's $320 million in value project. It's a 10 story hotel that I still own today. And then uh, 450 apartments above it. And then rooftop bar, restaurants. You know, it's a multi purpose project. But um, that one, luckily, I had the timing exactly right. And, uh, you know, that's not one I could have got wrong. I wouldn't want to get the timing wrong on that one. Um, and, you know, that was delivered, you know, probably a year and a half ago now. And, you know, I would say it's probably, you know, my legacy to date is that project. And, you know, that was my dream. That was, a t that was when I was 10 years old. That was the dream to deliver, to have some, in some impact on the skyline of, of Melbourne. And at that time, I felt like, you know, I'd, I'd achieved that. Yeah, it's a very attractive building, which happens to be in those dark hues that you talked about earlier on. Yeah. Yep. Um, is there something about shadows or darkness that appeals to you? Um, I think it's intriguing. I think that just light and bright, uh, you know, I'm not saying I don't like light, bright apartment living. And my apartments are quite light and bright, but my common areas, my hallways, the look and feel of the BPM brand is very dark and moody. You know, I wanted to create cool, young, edgy, affordable apartments. You know, my apartments, we are priced at the, the absolute base level. We are competing against, you know, the lowest, lowest level developer that's just trying to get their bottom line out of the development. That's all they're in it for. And I'm, I'm wanting to produce or produced what I believe is a you know, really sexy, cool, edgy product for, you know, people that, you know, desire more than just, you know, red and blue and purple and, you know, multicolored, cheap apartments or what I call balcony driven architecture. Well, you know, you look at a tower and all I can look at is the, the balconies. Um, but I like to create buildings that my eye can sit across the whole building, a bit like a piece of artwork. You know, I don't like to look at one piece of it. I want to look at it, at it as its entirety. My, most of my buildings are only one or two colours. They're very simple architecture. But the more simple, to make something look really beautiful that's really simple, becomes very complex. And you made a pretty cool short film as part of the... Yeah, I've done a couple of short films, yeah. yeah. I remember seeing that thinking that was pretty cool. It must have been fun to produce, was it? Look, I enjoyed the process. Yeah. Look, it, you know, it's, it's out there. A lot of people were like, you know, it's not meant to be understood. It wasn't meant to be a, you know, a strict storyline that everyone understood. It's about creating intrigue. And it certainly did that. It made people, a lot of people attach themselves to the brand. It's why I've done an interior fragrance and candles and I've got a soup business and cocktail bars, restaurants. All of these things are so that people can come and attach themselves to my brand before they're ready to maybe rent an apartment or buy an apartment from me. It's attaching people to my brand, you know, early on. Yes, I was going to, uh, I did have written down here to talk about your branding and I was aware that you had your own scent. What's yes. the thinking behind the scent and the suits and sure? Well, the, it's an interior scent. It's not a it's not a personal scent, and it's just that you know any building you walk into of mine, it has the same scent. It's instantly recognisable. You know whether it's out in Carnegie or in Brisbane or you know in the CBD. It's you know you walk into the foyer and you'll know it's my building. It's, one of, it's a BPM building. And is that scent it's also just something or? nice we give as a gift to people. We have a candle that has the same scent. We, it's, a, it's, a, it's a gifting process that we give people, you know, at settlement or you know, inspections, things like that. And is that scent based off what uh, Carpenter Jonathan smelled like after a 14-hour day on <laughs> No, certainly not. It's a little more sophisticated than that. <laughs> yeah. BPM, what's the meaning behind that? Look, you know, we don't talk about that too much these days because it's sort of been left behind, but it started as Bayside Project Management. And I didn't want to, I had built, even when it was called Bayside Project Management, I, you know, built quite a following then. 
and so we formed it into BPM. But you know, it's certainly not known as Bayside Project Management now. <laughs> it has no real meaning now. Uh, I've seen some videos of you on Insta. I think coming out of a mm. cryo vac or some sort mm. of, <laughs> some kind of freezer. Yeah, yeah, I'm really into this. What's going on there? Uh, look, yeah, it's a it's they call it a chamber. It's minus 110. I go into it for three minutes, and look, you know, this of late, especially in this, you know, through this, uh, you know, last eight months of you know all that we've been through, I felt like a certain heaviness. You know, so much unknown. You know, I've got a lot of businesses that have been completely closed. My hotel was completely closed. A lot of my restaurants, projects in LA. You know, construction company having to try and work at fifteen percent. You know, I haven't been in an era that I've had to deal with as much as I have this year. And I find that somebody said to me, "Oh, when I go to cryo, I just feel incredible when I come out," and I find it releases that 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 heaviness on my chest. I come out with this high. I come out almost giggling. It, you know, it really rejuvenates me and I'm really into health and fitness. I work out every single day and it's supposed to, you know, do things like increase my testosterone levels and adrenaline levels and help with recovery. All the football clubs use them. Um, and yeah, I've been really enjoying it. I go three or four times a week. Well, I hope it's no challenging. One, hope no one flicks your nipples when you get out of there. They might <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, inc it's incredibly cold. <laughs> it's a challenge. It is. I'm glad you touched on the challenges that you've faced this year. What do you think, or what have you learned about yourself this year? Or what are the challenges that you've had to deal with? Um, oh, look, they're mul multiple. It's more that, you know, it was, it took an incredible amount of courage to grow my business, but it's taken even more courage and, you know, I think tenacity to slow it down. You know, I've never thought I was bigger than the market. I feel like I've always been prepared for a market change or a market turn. And I always said to myself, I'm not going to fight against it. When it stops, I'm going to get out. I'll stop. I will literally pull the pin on it until it comes back. You know, it's the love of my life is, my, is developing. So I'll, I'll come back to it. But through this process, I've had to come to the realization that it's not the time to put my foot on the floor. I need to stop buying sites. I need to stop growing my business. We have let people go. And it's about slowing it down and you know getting ready for the next phase but it's a slow down process and that's probably you know been one of the biggest challenges of my life is slowing down well, what do you think you've learned about yourself in well along the journey um oh look it's you know so much you know i from the from those earlier days i really defined myself by my business i used to it was almost when I would have, it might sound a bit extreme, but if I had times within my business that I thought it might actually fail, and there were times that, you know, I'd gone so hard and so long on so many projects, and like we went into the GFC, there was moments I remember thinking, my God, I think I've gone too hard. I may, you know, this may not get through. Um, it was almost like I was going to die. That's the, the fear in me was the same, felt like that. That was because I completely defined Jonathan Hallen and his BPM and the businessman and the success. I think that's a very dangerous place to be. So, you know, I've learned to, you know, grow out of that, evolve and know that, like, even if BPM's not flying, I'm still okay. Um, you know, that was a, a, a big learning experience to be able to differentiate the two. Um, and also just there's more to life than success or business success. You know, there's a lot, a lot of other, other things to enjoy. You know, I spent 25 years completely 100% dedicated to business and success and all that it took to, to be that, what I defined as successful. And, you know, really I came out, I remember got to probably about 38, 39. I was a pretty naive person because I was only great at business. You put me in a social situation of different people working, I couldn't, wouldn't have a clue. A lot of people started to say to me, oh, Jonathan, for such a successful guy, you're so naive. And that was because... I just hadn't lived life. I hadn't travelled. I hadn't had a whole lot of different relationships. I hadn't put my mind to lots of areas of life. I hadn't lived. I hadn't had a lot of life experiences. Most people have had had a lot of business experience, but not a lot of life experience. What triggered? I've, I've learned to let them. What do you mean? Sorry to interrupt you. What triggered you to think I should expand beyond just my business and look to what else is in life? What what else I can enjoy in life? I got to a Christmas period 
And I sat with some of my managers and I think we'd like four times in size. We had the most amazing, incredibly successful year. I was devastated with the year. I was mad. I wasn't happy. I was going into my Christmas party, doing my Christmas speech, and I was not happy about it. And, you know, with my sales and marketing manager at the time, just said, you know, Jonathan, what's going on, mate? Look what you've done and look at all you've created. It's incredible. If that's not what's rewarding you, you better start looking at some other things that will because this is not this is not going to reward, you know, this, this is not all that can reward you. Find some other things. And it sort of made me think, yeah, you might be right. Maybe because it was somewhat insatiable, my appetite for success. It wasn't being, you know, satisfied in any way. And so how I think that's a, that's a trait of a successful person. If you're easily satisfied, you're not going to go, you're not going to put yourself through all that it takes to do it because it's hard. It's really hard. Yeah. And how did that bump up against Jonathan who wanted, always wanted to be a property developer? Look, again, it's another big challenge I went through um, and I've gone through a process had some help people have helped me you know realize that you know yeah there's lots of else in life and you know i've started to i started to already slow things down but it was the market that really pushed me to slow it down but since i have and it's allowed me to you know do other things um yeah i think you know i consider a really successful person now as somebody that's got balance i always said if you've got balance you're never going to be truly successful there's no way the, an Olympian has balance. There's no way even the AFL footballers mid-season have balance. Those, you know, some truly successful people don't have it, I didn't think. But now I look at and say, well, if you don't have balance, you, you're not successful. And if you cast your mind back over your career, what do you reckon the biggest learning experience is that you've had? What was, was there something that really, really challenged you, probably the biggest challenge you faced? Um, yeah, it's a good question. I think it's it's not necessarily any one thing. One thing I look back and say, without the things that I failed, I never would have had the success I had. And at the time when I was, I'd had a, something had gone wrong or I'd made the wrong decision, and somebody once said to me, you know, success is not a good teacher. And I thought, Fuck, I don't want to hear that. I didn't need, I don't need this lesson to learn the lesson. But absolutely, the, my greatest failings have been my greatest lessons. And there's no way without those lessons I would have got anywhere near the success I had. Agreed. So uh, mm. the greatest uh, lesson lesson that you had, some of the greatest lessons that you had, what, what would you put those down as? Um, look, I'd say one of them was that through the GFC, equity levels changed. This was probably one of the moments I was in my greatest fears when I was losing the most sleep because... Say I had 10 projects running, I knew I needed a certain amount of equity. Overnight, the amount of equity you needed per project went up by 50%. I didn't have enough equity. I didn't have enough equity to deliver all the projects that I had coming up and in the pipeline, you know, and at that stage, I didn't have the investment to, to help drive it through either. But overnight, I, it, the banking system changed. No longer could I ring up my bank manager and say, I want to buy a property on the week and give me a few hundred grand overdraft or 500 grand overdraft the the personal side of banking and borrowing money was gone and i think it's gone it's, you know it's still not there now you know everything is just very much systems processes you know credit departments which you can't even speak to it's just it, it's the friendly businessman side of banking is gone and you know that taught me to become more 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 sophisticated have more you know Look to the look to our future and plan the future because you know you couldn't rely on a system. I couldn't rely on the banking system. I couldn't do a feasibility and say I know I can borrow eighty percent of cost. Back then, we were borrowing eighty percent of end value. Uh, there yes. wasn't a lot of equity in the projects. No, those were the good old good days. <laughs> That's right. So that changed overnight. But you know, I learned a lot from it. It made me a lot more sophisticated. And certainly prepared me better for you know ch a change in markets, which you know any property developer in the last few years, you know, with all the government changes and banking changes and foreign policies, and so much has changed in our market that has challenged our market. That you know, if you weren't prepared for that, then you probably would have been hurt. And so, what was it that you did then to to bolster your situation? Well, I had to slow things down. I couldn't be running them as as fast and, you know, keep building the pipeline as much. So I had to firstly slow down 
And then this was starting to be the time when I started to say, I'm going to need to bring in some investment. I need someone that's, that I, one thing I thought was, is a lot of people have a lot of money. There's not that many people that can go and do everything that I do all day, every day. You know, I, as I said, I build a business that own the development cycle. Surely people with money are going to want to be, you know, come in and tap into that. And so I owned all of that side. And I actually found the finance and obtaining obtaining partners really, really easy. Well, you know, that wasn't the difficult part. So what's, so what's next then? You've done the big towers, now what? Make yeah, sure. Towers. Look, I will definitely go back to doing the towers. Right now is not the time to be doing those large scale projects. Um, property development for me right this minute, the risk reward scenario of it, I think is, is not balanced. I don't believe, you know, all of the feasibilities that we're doing and that I'm seeing are uh, just not balanced from a risk reward point of view. If I sit back and just say, I'm the investor in that project, it's not my business, it's not what I care about, would I take the risk for that amount of reward? Um, right at the moment where land values to end values compared to risk of sale, I'm not comfortable with it. So, you know, I have a bank of land and we're not developing it right now. We're going to sit back and watch. So my office has really turned into what's like a family office. We've become investment and we're looking at investment opportunities. You know, my construction business, though, is still, you know, growing and that's been an you know, incredible business. You know, I'll still put a lot of effort and time and energy into that. Um, but from a development side, it's just I'm not, I'm not quite comfortable with it right now. That will change. Cycles are short. People go, oh, my God, the cycle's over. I'm never going to be able to develop again. I'm talking like maybe a two-year, maximum three-year time period. I can see there's going to be an enormous turnaround. There will be great incentives. The balance will change. You know, and we'll be back. When you think back now to some of your earlier projects or some of the smaller projects, what, what would you miss most about them? From the early ones? Oh, just from some of your smaller projects to now where you've oh. done your bigger projects. Are there things that you miss about those smaller ones? No, no, I loved the energy of the big projects and, you know, you know, I'm a big risk taker and I loved the risk of it, the unknown of it and, you know, pushing my boundaries to the next is what gave me the greatest reward. And, you know, the smaller projects, I think I was pretty frustrated. I was doing them to get to the next spot. I wasn't really getting rewarded by them. But the larger scale projects where every decision is so vital, um, you know, is where I got the greatest reward. That's where I'm in my element. And tell me, what do you reckon the best piece of advice is that you've ever received? Um, broadly, as a, as a property investor, I would always, a lot of my friends ask me, should I get into the market, should I not? It's always been, I think the risk of being out is greater than the risk of being in. I would never be out of the property market, ever. And that's why my business model is, we keep 20% of everything I've ever developed. Because over history, it's gone up. There might be better investments and, you know, I often speak to stockbrokers and they try and do the, you know, the charts and spreadsheets for me and show me how it's better. For me, it's not. You know, I think property is a very safe place. You can leverage it and it's a place to always be in. And don't try and pick it. You know, I've never met a, ri a rich chartist in my life, not a really wealthy one anyway. I don't believe in it. I'm not trying to pick the future. I get a feel for markets and sure. But trying to say I'm going to get in the market and get out is just, stay in the market and always be in it. What would be your top tip for developers out there that are looking to take their business to the next level? Because you've obviously taken your business to multiple levels mm. along the way. Yeah, sure. Um, okay. It's a, I have covered a little bit of it, but it is, it, you must have a brand today. Property development is sophisticated now and it's incredibly competitive. It's one thing, you know, I've travelled a lot now and seen development in many places around the world. I can tell you Australia is incredibly sophisticated and competitive market compared to the rest of the world. We are years above places you would think are above us. You know, I'm, you know, I've got an office in LA and we're looking at doing projects there. I've got a number of hospitality projects they're running. But from a development point of view, they are nowhere near to the level of sophistication that we are. So I would say you need to be able to have understand the process of development intimately. I cannot believe how many developers I speak to and they don't really understand GST, they don't really understand feasibilities, nor the process that it takes to actually deliver the, 
the whole cycle of development. But brand is number one. If you don't have a brand, you don't have something to stand for or stand by, why would someone come in and give you a million bucks for an apartment before you've built it? It's the brand. And it's standing by something with that brand is my, is my greatest piece of advice. But be sophisticated. So what is it about the Melbourne, or not the, but the Australian market that you say is sophisticated compared to, say, some of these other cities that you might oh. think of, like LA? Um, well, it's a bit like how we sell our apartments, our display suites, the marketing, the videos, the brochures, you know, the way we go about selling our projects and the process we take, you know, the, how we take a global approach to selling our project. And there's a very step-by-step -step process that we take. Um, the product, how design savvy we are. You know, you walk into a two bedroom, two bathroom apartment in Melbourne right now, in a city, they are red hot. They are absolutely designed down to every single millimeter of the apartment. The kitchens are super cool. The bathrooms are incredible. There's every gadget you can imagine. They are an incredible place to live. Like, you know, they are not a pokey shoebox, you know, that's, you know, a cheap kitchen out of China and a little bathroom no one's thought about. Every millimeter of these apartments, because we're in such a competitive environment, is well thought out. There's generally a place for everything. And, you know, it's certainly not the product that you can see in other, other countries. We are, we are world leading in our product. All right, let's switch gears a little bit and uh, oh. find out who Jonathan Hallinan would sit down for dinner with if he could have three people. Yeah. Sit down with. Um, Alive that's a good one. Yeah, sure. Um, I think Jamie Pack would be a good one, you know. He's had a tyrant as a father and, you know, we all look at him and say, you inherited all those billions. How lucky were you? And I'd love to get into his head and understand, you know, the process and what he's been through. And, you know, I take my hat off to him, actually. You know, he sold down a lot of his father's assets and got into gambling and gaming and you know, he's made some incredible decisions. But, you know, he seems like a, a guy that's, you know, also had it pretty tough in a lot of ways. I'd love to get into his head. Say, um, uh, I've always wanted... Sorry, to Sorry? I reckon Jamie would probably say, why on earth would you want to get into my head? <laughs> I'm trying to get out of it. Yeah, probably. Yeah, no, look, he looks a bit <laughs> troubled, I agree. But, you know, it's... You know, I often think people admire people, but they don't actually know. You know, a lot of people say to me, oh, gee, Jonathan, I'd love to have your success. I'd love to have a business like you. And I'm like, mm, are you sure? Do you really know what you... You know, there's a lot to that and a huge amount of sacrifice and, you know, personal sacrifice that has gone into building it, so... Um, the other one is I've always wondered how the Crown Casino was financed. Ron Walker and Lloyd Williams had a business, you know, somewhat like mine, of developing apartments across Australia, and all of a sudden they did a multi-billion-dollar casino on the forefront of Mel on the foreshore there of Melbourne. I don't know how they did it. I don't know how they financed it, and I can't find out how they did. I want to sit down and work out how the hell they did it. <laughs> uh, well, Ron's moved <laughs> and on. And then sold it to the well, Packers. <laughs> he might have taken yeah, Ron's gone. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah. <laughs> yep, and. Finally, they're my three: Ron Walker, Lloyd Williams, and Packer. Oh, okay. I thought I was. I just took Sorry. Ron and Lon, Ron Lloyd as a, as a package deal. But no, that's okay. No, they're my three. What about a favourite book or anything that you might recommend to people? Um, oh, look, I'm not into the sort of general self help books and things like that. It's, I'm not good with the book recommendations. Movie. Um, my favourite movie, is Stand by Me. My favourite from when I was a kid, it's about, you know, friendship and loyalty and, you know, I live by it. Very good. Well, speaking of uh, mm. friendship and family, what, what do your um, family of academics now think when they drive around Melbourne and see buildings that you've produced popped mm. up all around the place? Yeah, it's a good, it's a good one. Look, they're my, you know, biggest fans. My mum, when she comes to my building, still cries and, you know, they're, Incredibly proud. Unfortunately, I lost my dad when I was really young, so he hasn't got, he didn't get to see it. But um, yeah, certainly my family are incredibly proud and, you know, you know, tell me so. Big supporters. Been great to have them. Yeah. Very lucky to have them. They must be very proud to see what you've achieved and no doubt still have to achieve. Right. You're probably not even halfway yet. So. Yeah, that's right. Let's hope so. Any final parting piece of advice or comment that you'd like to make? Um, I just think, you know, to, the up and coming developer, it's, you know, 
it is an incredibly rewarding business, but it is so incredibly challenging that, you know, understand it and really, you know, get to know your business. The most successful developers that I know, they know their business better than anybody. So it's the, it's the intricate details. They're the things that I feel that um, young developers that are gung-ho and just gone buy sites and, and also don't rely on anyone. Whose advice? Like why would, why would somebody go to an architect to get their advice on a property development? They're not developers, they're architects. They know how to design the building and create it and draw it all and they're not property developers. So it's know your market and deliver your own product. Be your own man. That's, that's the biggest fault I've seen in property developers is they rely on other people's advice rather than taking their own. Well, Jonathan, thanks for sharing some time with us and your insights on uh, property development. As, as I said, with, uh, I get lots of requests to, to have you on the show, so there'll be lots of sure. happy people out there now. So thanks for Very sharing good. your insights uh, with us. If people want to find out more about Bayside Property Management or BPM, <laughs> where, can, where can they go? It's just bpmcorp.com.au. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for your time. Enjoy right. it. Thanks. Uh, th thank you to you, Jonathan. Thanks for being on the Property Developer Podcast. Appreciate it. See you later. Thanks, Bye. Bye. You've been listening to the Property Developer Podcast. Tune in next time for more tips, ideas, and inspiration to take your developing to the next level. For more developing love, make sure to visit propertydeveloperpodcast.com.